Okay, so um, anyway, so as, as I was doing, doing my slides this morning, um, I was thinking about what to say. Um, so, and I'm going to start off with my usual, usual thing. So psychiatric disorders, the one thing that characterizes them, I think, is their, um, their complexity, characterizes all of them is their complexity. Um, and that extends all the way from um, sort of basic epidemiology through to neuroimaging through to genetics. Um, um, there actually has been an enormous amount of work in genetics in psychiatric disorders, um, thanks mainly to a lot of the work, especially in family and twin studies, has been has been done thanks to the nature nurture wars essentially. So, and Robert, I'm sure, will talk about that next week. So, but um, causality essentially in psychiatric disorders has often ended up sort of being confused. So families um, have ended up getting blamed for phenotypes such as autism and anorexia. And genetic studies have uh, essentially shown that the picture is actually far more complex. Um, I think a remarkable thing about, about psychiatric disorders in general, though, is that they're extremely prevalent in society and are actually quite heritable. So the thing to remember is that if you look at similar plots and other me or similar information in other medical specialities, generally you will have lower heritability estimates. So psychiatric disorders do, do not have low heritabilities. They actually have reasonably high heritabilities. But the question is what underlies that? And, um, you know, so you can estimate heritability, that comes from twin and family studies that is basically estimating, estimating the, the effect of the whole genome and estimates direct and indirect genetic effects, which, of which you'll hear more next week. Um, but for the purposes of my talk, we, we're considering that the heritability must arise from variation in DNA. And DNA is in the nucleus of all cells. Um, there's roughly three billion bases of DNA spread across 23 pairs of chromosomes, uh, with uh, nearly equal contribution from um, your mother and your father. Um, DNA can be thought of as an information-containing polymer. Oh, yeah, this is Ollie Payne's slide, I should say, not mine. Yes. So um, DNA can be thought of as an information-containing polymer. And um, genetics, although, although DNA makes protein, makes RNA, makes protein, uh, DNA also contains a lot of other information, um, regulatory information that allows discrete and time-dependent expression of genes. Um, and, but basically, um, you can think of DNA as a code, and it exists on a sense and an antisense strand, or in other words, A's and T's bind to each other, B's and C's bind to each other, and you have a strand of DNA, and then you have its mirror image. Um, gene discovery, though, um, has, has been hard. So heritability is um, you know, although they, they were individually hard, they were quite hard to establish it initially, finding genes has, has arguably been even harder and has relied on, upon technological advance. So, um, in terms of genetic variation um, across the genome, right, we think that the role of genetic variation is essentially to contribute to phenotypic variation too, and the sum of all the effects of the genetic variation should equal the heritability. Okay, so um, there are, roughly speaking, one in every six bases in the genome is, va is variable in the population. Um, and there, there are various different types of variation. We don't necessarily need to be concerned about them, but the one that people use the most is single nucleotide polymorphisms, so these simple single base pair changes. Um, and because we have two of each chromosome, we get, the, we get two, ver two 
cancer causing genotypes. So you have two alleles in your genotype. But then you also get variable number tandem repeats, copy number of polymorphisms, insertion, deletions, and inversions of DNA. Um, but that's another you know, two years of genetics lectures, so we won't go there. Um, the basic idea with the genetic association study is that you pick a genetic variant for some reason, um, and then you look at it at its frequency in cases and in controls. And simply put, you, you want to see <coughs> whether or not, sorry, you, you're looking at it in cases and in controls. And simply put, you want to see whether or not a given allele is more frequent or less frequent in cases versus controls. So, um, how we originally tried to identify genes um, has gone through several different phases. Uh, so, what I'm not going to really talk about today is linkage analysis. So, this is the idea that you can use very large families or, lar or collections of families to try and find particular regions of the genome. It might be important in a, in a, in a, in a disorder. Um, but that, that didn't really work. So that, that, so that went through a sort of replication crisis in the 90s with um, kind of uh, <coughs> splash papers in nature, splash non-replications in nature, grumpy letters, um, back and forth, people shouting, shouting at each other at conferences, etc. This is in the mid-1990s, right? So, um, and, um, but then people started doing candidate gene work and started doing association in what they thought were relatively large samples of, I don't know, maybe 200 cases and 200 controls, which is, you know, laughably tiny. Uh, my apologies to the neuroimagers in the audience. Um, but um, the, the, and the idea here was basically to pick a candidate gene. <coughs> with, um, and the, the idea here is to pick a biologically plausible gene that you think, given what you know about the biology of the disorder, or some other evidence, uh, is plausibly associated with the disease. Um, you then, within that gene, go to, go to the genetic market variation within that gene and try and pick a functional polymorphism, a functional genetic variant that is reasonably frequent in the population. Um, now, there, now, we used to think that this could be done easily. We now know that your average gene has several thousand vari variants and or that potentially could be involved with its function. And actually to try and guess which, which polymorphism is functional is actually a fool's errand a lot of the time. Um, so, so then, um, but anyway, the candidate gene error happened anyway. So, and it seemed attractive at first. So the idea was to use traditional hypothesis-driven science, pick your, your, your functional gene, identify your functional variant, measure it in cases and controls, and then do a PhD on it like I did. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a seven-year PhD, but so, um, but um, this era um, was characterized by a, a kind of growing, initially hope. So the first candidate gene studies when they came out were in 50 cases and 50 controls, and they reported massive effect sizes. And then people started doing larger sample sizes, and once they got to a couple of, couple of hundred, they started seeing positive results, but very inconsistent results, so replication. Um, so we went through this phase where someone would claim a replication, but when you went into the data, you would actually see it was in the opposite direction. Um, and the overall replication level um, was very low um, in, in amongst the groups who were doing stuff that we thought, you know, that, we, that, we thought, that people thought was reliable. And then John Ioannidis published this paper in 2005, why most published research findings are false. Um, and you know, he cited uh, genetics 
in that quite a lot. Um, now, can a gene work? So genetics exists across medicine and plant world and microbiome, microbi microbiology, etc. But um, can a gene work was done across medicine, and in psychiatry it led us to many false starts. And um, the the sort of main problems beyond what I've mentioned is small n leading to inconsistent results, and you know the, the whole idea that you can you know know very little about a system but still try and hypothesis hypothesize about it uh, led us to many problems. But then we also had the usual problems which are familiar to people from um, you know, psycho psycho the re more recent psychology replication crisis, you know, the file drawer problem, you know, people published positive findings, um, journals, um, in fact some journals still um, don't like to publish negative findings. Um, but the more fundamental problem with um, the candidate gene methodology, even when you were being honest and publishing your negative results was that the methodology itself didn't allow you any control of type 1 or didn't allow adequate control of type 1 error. So, um, so um, there are many reasons why things haven't replicated, but in GWAS, genome-wide association studies, um, we can control adequately for type 1 error, and I'll go into a bit more about that later. So there have been several papers now that have used genome-wide data, GWAS data, on large samples to go back and estimate associations with candid previously published candidate genes. So a recent example just this year is from Border et al., uh, where they use data from the UK Biobank, sample sizes of between about 60,000 and about something like 200,000 people from UK Biobank. And they, they looked at historical candidate gene or candidate gene interaction hypotheses for me, or reports for major depression. And um, they first of all reviewed the literature. Um, and actually a scary number of studies have been published on um, some of the genes that are most famous. So this is the serotonin transporter. Uh, this is DDNF. Uh, this is COMT, uh, catechol methyl transferase, um, and so on. Um, now you can see that um, there's, two, there's two or three things going on here. BDNF, I'm not going to talk about much today, except to say that BDNF is an interesting gene, um, but it's actually reasonably strongly associated with smoking and with BMI. So some of the reasons it's been com coming up in psychiatric GWAS studies are probably to do with candidate gene methodology, but also to do with the fact that you might be, have healthy controls and obese or smoking patients. Um, but um, serotonin transporter has been uh, the most popular um, candidate gene uh, and amongst the most controversial. Um, in the border paper, what they did then was go back to, you know, whether it was a direct effect or an effect on severity of phenotype or an interaction with trauma or whatever. They went back and did that analysis um, in the UK Biobank data. And uh, these are the results. I'll, I think just to tell you that basically they found effects in the opposite. They found generally no significance. And even if you just look at whether, whether the effects are in the same direction or not, they found basically 50-50 one direction or the other. So, um, so it, and similar work has been done in schizophrenia. Similar work has been done in diabetes and in other complex phenotypes. So we now know that this, you know, basically this entire literature of candidate gene studies doesn't really hold up. And it's not to say that there weren't honest scientists trying to do good work. It's just that the methodology right, doesn't yield reliable results. And I often say to my students that the most, you know, that the, the most valuable part of a candidate gene paper is actually the introduction. Because actually, you know, because that's where people, you know, review the evidence and talk about 
do it. The discussion, however, is generally not um, useful. And um, so John Ioannidis' 2005 paper, then he had these corollaries looking at you know, replication crisis in, as it was then. And he concluded that the smaller the studies, uh, the less likely the research findings were to be true. The smaller the effect sizes, the less likely they were to be true. And um, then the sort of flexibility, well, the greater the number of tested relationships, the less likely they were to be true. And the greater number of, the greater the flexibility in design and definitions and outcomes and analytical models in a scientific field, the less likely it was that research findings would be true. Now, I think there's a few points that are here, right? So um, it's hard maybe to, maybe it's just useful to, to, to say that in 2005, 2006, the genetics field, the molecular genetics field anyway, was going through a, a long dark night of the soul. So they were wondering if they would ever find, um, or we were wondering if we would ever find re replicated things. And um, it is true to say that um, statistical genetics and genetics in general um, was characterized by a huge number of analytical methods and new statistical methods that were being designed to be applied to the data, right? Because people, people had the idea that if they just did the analysis a different way, they could, they could find the associations. And actually, ironically now, with, the, with our gigantically large data sets, uh, we simply do linear log logistic regressions most of the time, right? So we, we do, you know, just, just one step beyond the chi-square test uh, for, for what we do, right? We're not applying, you know, some of these things, you know, you know that, that were, were being proposed of our, you know, seem now preposterous, but at the time it were, seemed to be okay. But, but anyway, um, but we, we now know, though, that we need, what we need in genetics is essentially much greater rigor in what we do. Um, oh yeah, the other, the other thing is that um, um, the, what the Border paper showed clearly was that candidate gene studies are still being funded and published, so funding agencies are still funding candidate gene studies, and people are still publishing them. Um, and it's, it's really uh, quite, um, quite interesting, you know, how the largest data sets, you know, millions of individuals in them can show that there's no association, but the funding agency can still fund a grant, right, in the area. Um, I think the ones in blue, the ones I highlighted in blue boxes here, are ones I've published on. about. Um, so, okay, but anyway, so, um, but hope did arrive, although slowly. So from 2006 onwards, people started doing genome-wide association studies. The idea here is to take a step back and say, okay, we know that the total sum of genetic effects across the genome underlies the heritability. We know we're not very good at, at trying to identify which genetic variants are just from hypothesis-driven stuff. So let's try and just have a design whereby we can test a sufficiently large proportion of genetic variation in a large enough sample size to identify effects. And many, many technical challenges were overcome here. And most of them uh, relate to how genome-wide associates genome-wide association studies were designed, but also things like dealing with population stratification, things dealing with DNA sample quality issues, other things that, um, that the, the people who used GWAS data to, to fail, used GWAS data to test the previous candidate gene hypothesis have utilized. So um, GWAS fundamentally, okay, I'm not gonna go into genetics too much, but GWAS fundamentally is about indirect association. So humans, like any other mammalian species, or even more so than most mammalian species, um, don't have a, a tremendous amount of genetic variation, and the genetic variation that we have tends to be quite intercorrelated. 
So, i.e., if you measure a genetic variant at one position, you're also gathering information about the things that it's correlated with nearby. Um, and just to confuse people, in genetics we call correlation linked to disequilibrium. So, um, but the idea here is that in a, in a GWAS, you can take a map of genetic variation across the genome. You can do these correlation analyses, and then you can select high information containing genetic variants or tagging SNPs. And you can use um, uh, basically, basically you know, printing technology to print probes for these uh, variants onto a, a genotyping array. Um, so this isn't sequencing, this is basically a hybridization of DNA to, to a slide. Um, and this technology you know, of genome-wide SNP chips um, is very scalable and there have now been I don't know, tens of millions of these things sold. So the cost per sample of doing uh, a GWAS has gone down and down to you know, now it's below 30 pounds per sample, including handling the DNA and things like this. So, um, so the cost has gone lower and lower. And I think one thing that's, one thing that's um, kind of driven costs slow in genetics is that DNA samples are portable. So they can go from one center to another. Whereas uh, for some other things, like uh, in, like, so like pa patient-driven analyses, like in neuroimaging, patients aren't very portable. So you can't really then, you don't really have the same market forces that drive down cost or the same incentives uh, for companies to come in with new technologies that are that make things much much cheaper. Um, but anyway, so because it's so cheap, then what people have have at first slowly and now rapidly are doing is to test as many cases and as many controls as they can afford to do and map associations across the genome. And there are now tens of thousands of GWAS hits across medicine. And we're nearing a thousand in, in psychiatry. Um, so I don't know what he said that. Um, we have um, a multiple testing problem, though, when we do a GWAS. So even if you're only doing half a million tests, you would expect 25,000 to be below a nominal p-value of 0.05. <coughs> and actually, we think in a GWAS, we're doing a million tests. So, so the p-value threshold that we use is simply p equals 0.05 corrected per million tests. Um, there's a lot of theoretical work behind that, justifying it, but anyway. But, but, but basically, 5 by 10 to the minus 8 is p equals 0.05 corrected. So it's a family-wise error rate, 0.05. Um, we define suggestive significance as 5 by 10 to the minus 6, which is actually you know, P equals 0.99, <laughs> if you want to think about it in a, but actually what we see in genetics when we do this type of, of analysis is there are generally, not in this particular plot, but there are generally many things in the suggestive range as well, you know, as well as an increasing number of things in the genome-wide significant range. And GWAS started in 2006, um, and coming, we were just coming out of the candidate gene error era, and um, initial studies were in small ends, maybe 2,000 cases and 3,000 controls. And in psychiatry, these failed to, failed to yield um, much. And by 2008, then people began to get worried about GWAS too, because you know, scientists are nothing if not endlessly neurotic. Um, and, um, but, but gradually then, come 2009, 2010, people began to get uh, larger sample sizes. And key for that in psychiatry has been the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. Um, so it's one of the, you know, it's the largest consortium ever in terms of raw data sharing. Um, and it's, the results of our analyses are freely available. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you the website for that a little bit later. Um, so 
The first disorder that made really significant progress was schizophrenia. So they moved from an analysis of 2,600 cases in 2009 rapidly over the space of five years to over ha having over 100, 100 uh, genetic associations uh, in the study of 36,000 cases. There's now a paper being written up um, with 64,000 cases and two, something like 255 uh, GWAS hits. Um, but this showed us then that um, essentially what had to happen is the sample sizes had to meet, had to reach sufficient power to detect the actual effect sizes in the genome, or put more short, in, in shorter terms, the sample size had to meet the real effect sizes. Right? So we couldn't make a, we, we sort of realized that we couldn't really make assumptions about the effect sizes that were in the genome. Right? The, the highest effect size common variant for schizophrenia is this one in HLA. And um, it has an odds ratio of 1.3 and accounts for, you know, doing it properly, not with the attributable fraction calculation, but doing it properly, it accounts for maybe about 1% of schizophrenia cases. And that's the largest effect size thing in the genome, even including any rare variant or other things for, for schizophrenia. So what about depression? So, um, so we do a lot of work on depression. Um, so schizophrenia, you know, it's hard enough in schizophrenia, but schizophrenia has two advantages. It's low, has low prevalence and high heritability. And population genetics theory tells us that, that will mean, that should mean that it has actually a reasonably high effect size genetic architecture. So if the effects were actually starting at odds ratios of 1.3 or so, or 1% of the phenotype in schizophrenia, then it's because depression is more prevalent and has a lower heritability, right? That means that a priori we should expect that the effects are, start, are gonna be lower in depression overall. And we then worked on depression for quite a long time. So uh, we had a paper in 2011, that was then the negative G was. We then had a, I got the short straw and managed to present um, what was then the largest negative G was in history at a conference. Um, 18,000 cases and 35,000 controls, and we found nothing. Uh, the now editor, well, the then editor of Nature Genetics, and now editor of Nature, liked my talk, but they weren't going to publish the paper. Um, but, and then we had this, had this funny exchange with the Dutch statistical geneticists. So, um, but this was, um, this was actually quite, quite interesting. So we were seeing very, very little. And people in the field, particularly some clinicians, were telling us that we weren't dealing with severe enough cases. We weren't dealing with real depression. Or, or the other thing is that we commonly hear is that depression is a heterogeneous phenotype. It's too heterogeneous for study. Etc. Right, but the, these cases here were clinically ascertained cases, most of whom um, met full criteria for MDD. Many of whom are recurrent MDD. Um, so we then went and, and enlarged our sample size, and that involved gathering data from lots of consortia. So some that are relatively open, like iSight and UK Biobank, and Generation Scotland. JIRA, some that you have to negotiate with, like Decode and 23andMe, and then some that had clinical characterization, and then some that basically were just asking people, have they been diagnosed by a clinician with depression? Right? So that's what the 23andMe phenotype was. But that analysis was quite successful, published last year in Nature Genetics, and identified 44 associations for, um, for depression. And uh, these subsequently have been replicated in other things. So they, they actually look quite, quite good and biologically interesting. But I'm not going to go into that necessarily. But we achieved that for depression. And actually what we're seeing now across psychiatry is that um, 
as sample sizes increase, so does discovery of genetic associations. Uh, by Pooler, recent paper, uh, 30 GWAS loci. Uh, anorexia, and we'll talk, talk about that in a, in a minute. Um, we have eight hits. Uh, autism, five hits. ADHD, 15 hits. Um, so now we know that if our sample sizes get large enough, we will have genetic, genetic discovery, and that allows us to do a few different things. One is identify genes, biology, to generate hypotheses for neuroscientists to work on. The other thing is it allows us to develop polygenic risk scores that can be used in study design, um, which I think I think I would, I would I would encourage people to think about using rather than candidate genes. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll just skip through that. I'm going to go to anorexia. So, okay, so you, so I've been talking a lot, a lot this week about anorexia. <coughs> we just had a, our genetics, our PGC, Psychiatric Genetics Consortium paper come out in Nature Genetics this week on anorexia. And um, the Eating Disorders Work Group um, has been around for five years now, uh, four years now. And um, eating disorders are kind of unusual. Um, they, the people uh, in this photo, this, these photos had to be taken at two different conferences because basically <coughs> uh, eating disorders people and genetics people go to different conferences. So genetics is not really a big topic in eating disorders. But we know that anorexia is roughly speaking 50 to 60 percent heritable. It's uh, fundamentally characterized by dysregulated eating and uh, a lack of recognition that a severely low body weight is dangerous. Um, and it's the most severe eating disorder. Um, okay, I'm just gonna go through that. So I'm gonna show a photo. This might be slightly triggering. So I just wanted to give a warning. So one of the things about anorexia is that it really is a, a very severe phenotype, um, patients often report uh, an almost delusion-like phenotype uh, in terms of their self-perception uh, of their own body weight and body shape. Um, anorexia has the usual genetics in psychiatry, so you know most psychiatric disorders are heritable. Um, Eating disorders form a kind of middle group, so they're more heritable than depression and anxiety, but less heritable than, let's say, schizophrenia and bipolar. Um, but no candidate gene, uh, candidate genes hold up. So there was this paper published three, four years ago now, um, association of 182 candidate genes in anorexia nervosa, uh, using thousands of patients, um, looking, trying to replicate candidate gene findings and replicating none of them. Um, so um, in the PGC eating disorders group, then we worked to combine data together. Uh, so GOFG was done on a lot of the samples that candidate gene work had been done on. And we published our first analysis in 2017 of three and a half thousand cases. And we had one uh, GWAS locus but um, we've sub subsequently been working to gather more cases, and uh, the Anorexia Nervosa Genetics Initiative um, was successful in gathering 13,000 anorexia cases worldwide. Um, and uh, they mainly gathered them to, through direct outreach to the public and via social media, and not clinical recruitment. Um, and that led to a large increase in sample size. So combining it with our previous, our previous data, and uh, doing some additional QC as well, we had almost 17,000 cases, 55,000 controls, and then we managed to find eight different GWAS loci. Um, these were individually quite interesting. Four of them are apparent single gene loci, which is quite unusual. Right, so we have four genes that we can probably go off and do work on. Um, but um, what was more interesting was that we found that anorexia had a metabolic component. 
And I think that's one of the other things about doing things in a hypothesis-free manner, right? So because GWAS is done on every, in every medical speciality, once you've done a GWAS, you can compare the results of your GWAS with GWAS is done in, uh, I don't know, in to toenail length or other phenotypes, right? You don't, um, you don't have to just do it within psychiatry. So within twin studies, people have been able to do what we call genetic correlations, so could be genetic sharing between traits, but to do that, they've had to measure the same traits in each individual in the study. What we've been able to do in GWAS is to use a genetic correlation methodology comparing the results of GWAS across traits to compare, for example, the genetics of, of um, BMI or body fat percentage in this case assayed in totally different samples with the genetics of anorexia directly. And what we found was that uh, anorexia had the expected positive genetic correlations with um, psychiatric disorders. Um, and I think one thing to point out here is that obsessive compulsive disorder has the highest genetic correlation with uh, anorexia. And um, we now, and that's one of the causality things I think that people may be getting wrong. The genetics of anorexia is associated with increased obsessive compulsive disorder symptoms, particularly perhaps perfectionism. And perfectionism observed in uh, anorexia cases is at least partially attributable not to their environment but to their genetics. Um, the other thing that we see is that um, Attainment of a college or university degree is associated, is associated with anorexia, but intelligence is not. So it's not on this graph, but IQ is not genetically correlated with anorexia. And that, that's probably perfectionism driven as well. Um, okay, so then the other thing that we found, which is more unusual, is negative genetic correlations. So effects in the opposite direction with insulin resistance, with fasting insulin, with leptin, um, type 2 diabetes, and etc. Uh, we also thought, found a positive genetic cor correlation with HDL cholesterol, the so-called good form of cholesterol. And um, we saw negative genetic correlations with a whole set of body composition parameters. So in UK Biobank and in other data sets, they've done They've basically done various different types of measurements, mainly by electrical impedance. Um, and they've, they've got these compartment models of being able to say for an individual, roughly speaking, what their body fat percentage is, what their total fat mass is, um, et cetera. And they've done you know, direct measurements as well. And we see that the highest genetic correlation that we see, or negative genetic correlation we see with uh, anorexia is body fat percentage. Um, and it's roughly speaking equal. Um, yeah, not in this graph, but when we separate it into males and females, it's roughly speaking equal uh, with the OCD. Okay, uh, genetic correlation. Um, okay, um, right. So I think that's most of that. So then, four key findings then from our anorexia work. is that we, well, I won't say all of this, we have single genes now that we can do some work on, I think, fairly confidently. Um, we see a metabolic component um, for anorexia, and um, anorexia clinically, right, um, although bloods are taken to monitor patients physiologically, right, there's no metabolic component to the treatment of the illness. So one of the things we want to do over the next few years is to see if we can identify, use this sort of new insight that genetics has given us to identify uh, metabolic biomarkers in anorexia that might help identify people who are treatment resistant. Um, okay, then I'm just going to go on to then just some general comments. So um, open science in genetics 
So one of the issues that we have in genetics is that genetic data is private data, right? And it's recognized as that in, in GDPR and in other data sets. The trouble is in, in GDPR, right, psychological data is also private data, right? And at the moment, at least in genetics world, what we're doing is we're doing lots and lots of MTAs every time we share genetic data. And, wanna, and I'll be quite interested to hear, I think you've got a talk booked in with someone from do you have a talk some, from someone first? Yeah, anyway, there's a talk in this series that's going to be about the legal, legalities of data sharing. I'd be interested, interested to, see, to see whether the same data sharing rules apply to psychological data as well as uh, genetic data. But in essence, then, we, for sharing data, we have to do a lot of MTAs, material transfer agreements, um, and agree to keep data private and not to identify individuals from their genetic data. We now have hotel type systems to do genetic analysis. So in the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium, we can get people logins to, you know, once the agreement, legal agreements are in place, we can get people logins to go and access the raw data to do their analysis. But it's not entirely satisfactory. Uh, however, UK Biobank and similar efforts are demo democratizing. So these open data sources that anyone can apply to access and download all of the data. Right, those are quite are quite useful, and, have been, and they have generated things like that border at our paper that I that I, I showed you. Um, and generally, in in genetics now, we tend to use open source coding. We put our code on GitHub. Most analyses are done in R and and or in Bash, and scripting in Python or whatever will be fashionable next. Um, I'll just give a plug for one of our websites. So Navigome is a data is a <coughs> web page we put up to allow people to explore uh, genetic correlations between traits and also then the biology um, behind different traits. Uh, all the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium summary data, the results, are available on the PGC website. And then um, if you want to have access to results before publication, or if you want to have access to raw data, you can submit a data access request. And there's a, there's a, there's a system on the, on the website that allows you to do that. It's just a simple online form that you have to fill in. And people, each work group has, has a, a representative who can guide people through the process about how to access the data. Give a plug for GLAD. Um, so this is the genetic links to anxiety and depression study. It's a study where we're trying to recruit 40,000 people with depression or anxiety. We're at about 28,000 cases now, um, or at least 28,000 people who've given us their clinical information, about 19,000 people who've given us DNA. Um, in GLAD, we're getting people to fill in a detailed questionnaire about their anxiety and depression symptoms. We're also generating GWAS data on everyone and then we're going to generate polygenic scores on everyone. And the idea of GLAD is that then it will form a, a recontactable resource so that people who want to carry out studies, let's say, of psychological interventions or just simple cognitive testing or other things, can apply to access GLAD. Um, and if you want to access GLAD to carry out studies, just email gladstudy at kcl.ac.uk. Okay? So. Thanks. So that's, al that's already happening. So with the iSight the iSight initiative in Denmark does that heel prick, which is, is done for phenylketonuria on every baby. Here as well. 
Uh, not here, no. So, um, so what they did in, in Denmark was that they, they stored the yield bricks in a freezer. And here we don't tend to do that. And then the DNA degrades. And people have proposed to me that we should do that, but I don't, you know, I don't, I don't simply, you know, I don't have six years of my life to work on improving DNA quality from degraded DNA. Um, so, so you know, going forward, do you think it would be a good idea to change the system? Um, I think that there's, there's a few different things. So what, what iSight does is they, they get, they have this like, um, they, get, they get the DNA from the heel bricks. They use their national clinical record management service then to get anonymized clinical records and get them to do the matching of the data. So then things are strictly anonymized and then everything is behind a, a firewall in Denmark and external researchers can apply to access it but they have to get an account on the Danish system and sign an agreement and, and so on. Um, the virtue of having a cohort like that is that it allows us to do proper epidemiology on the data. So one of the, one of the problems I think we have about genetics at the moment is that um, you know, there have been some interesting studies where people show that polygenic risk score for schizophrenia predicts dropout from studies early on in childhood. And we know that the more severely affected patients uh, don't tend to take part in studies as much, or at least the profile of the more severe patients that take part in studies may cognitively be, be quite different um, to the actual average profile in the, pop in the population. So I think we do do a lot of epidemiological type analysis like Mendelian randomization and other, other things. And it, you know, we have to be very careful about the ascertainment bias that we get. And so having, having, a, having a national level thing taking advantage of leftover samples is, is, is virtuous in that, in that regard. But then you can't go back to those, you can't recontact those people. So you <laughs> still need to have studies like LAD and other things where you can actually just directly recontact people. It is, it is, yeah. Um, I think poly polygenic scores um, are, you know, immensely more sensible to use than single genetic variants, and they account for a much larger fraction of the phenotype than any single genetic variant can ever hope to achieve, except in Alzheimer's disease, right, like for APOE, right? But that's, but I think um, most often, I think some of the, there's some caveats with that. Some of the, some of the studies I see using polygenic scores don't put all the covariates in that, that we recommend. And generally, if people want to apply polygenic scores, I would say collaborate with um, a geneticist or at least go see a geneticist to, and know what the covariates are. And you should be adding, and they're, they're mainly to do population stratification covariates. So, so one of the things about anorexia is because BMI is used to define the phenotype, yeah. okay, potentially our metabolic uh, correlations could be generated just because of the BMI threshold. Mm -hmm. So one of, there, there are some methods now that are used to basically control for um, BMI genetics. And there's two approaches that we did. So in that, in that particular bidirectional causality, that's called the Mendelian randomization approach. It's doing, you know, does anorexia influence um, BMI? <coughs> we remove those variants that are associated with BMI directly, and we find that it does. And does BMI influence anorexia? If you remove those variants that are associated with anorexia, and we find that it does. And the other approach, which isn't in the paper, 
which is another paper is just trying to control for control directly for the genetic effects of BMI in the anorexia GWAS and do sort of like a partitioned correlation. And we still see the met for metabolic and other other parameters in that in that case. So uh, so it's not it's not BMI dependent. And um, I think maybe that's one thing to get try and get across to a lot of patients or people who've had anorexia get upset about the you know, when you mention weight and and BMI. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we see these metabolic things coming through even if you control for BMI itself, you know, the genetics of BMI. So okay. yeah. From all this knowledge, um, is there anything now that you would say uh, is uh, should be already implemented for the care of patients that focus on things like that? Is it or is there anything you are unhappy that is not already implemented from all this research knowledge and you think we should already? Um So I, I think the big obvious thing for de for depression, right, is, is that pharmaco pharmacogenetics, right? So there are, there's, or maybe in psychiatry as a as a whole, you know, there are there's enough evidence to suggest that there are there are single discrete things that predict adverse events and predict metabolism that should be being measured systematically. Mm -hmm. um, and already, you think yeah. <coughs> I think people are people argue that it, that it is. Yeah, I mean, I I do think. I do think that if if, um, if psychiatry was a more pathology friendly speciality, we, some of those things would have been would have been implemented already. Mm -hmm. um, and I I think uh, it's not uh, yeah in depression it's not it, it's actually more applicable than in other other things. But there are some. But it's not to say that what you know. So for example, eating disorders is one area, right? So you. You do get people, people who work in eating disorders field who are completely anti a biological explanation, but then you get people who are just extremely keen. Um, and and in, in eating disorders, they do an awful lot of uh, pathology measurement and biological measurement in, in patients, in, certainly in inpatients anyway. And if we could systemize, system, if we could make that systematic and measure the same things across clinical sites, then we could build up the evidence base to use metabolism in predicting, let's say, treatment resistance, for example. 